how is it with the pathophysiology of it? So, if I'm going to draw a alveolus over here, like that, the important thing is, you know, there are two, two kinds of like bigger ones. You call them type 2 and tinier ones like flatter more that those are type 1 pneumocytes so that's the inside of the elbows then and then you have a so bay, basal membrane and whatever and of course over here so this is the elbow capillary membrane okay so here's the capillary and we got the endothelial cells over here lining okay yep so type 2 everyone knows this produces what surfactant okay okay and over here i'm going to have a small d2 to rds okay because at the end if you damage these so if you damage these, and if you damage these, and these, and these, what happens is it gets leaky, so from the other side, and the fluid gets this way. And not only fluid, I mean not water, but like I mean all the parts of the blood. So you can have erythrocytes there, you can have fibrin mash there, you can have uh, the coagulation cascade, and the debris, the dead cells, okay? So some of the, some of the cells will die, some will, will still live, but let's say the lining is is getting worse. And what you get here with the fibrin and everything that goes together, it's a hyaline membrane, okay? So basically, wherever it starts, if it's a primary or secondary, the point is first you're having edema, green is the water, it's edematous or oily diffusion is bad. But then it gets even worse because the alveoli will get full of everything, of the water, of the debris, of the dead cells, of the fibrin, of the all the coagulation factors and everything, and dead erythrocytes and everything, I mean, and, and immune system. And uh, this in total then gets packed and forms a hyaline membrane, okay? So th this is ARDS. I think you all can easily imagine what sort of happens over there, okay? So suddenly my alveoli, although the trigger is from outside or inside, the membrane gets leaky and the blood gets there. First only, let's say, fluid, but later all the particles, and I'm forming a hyaline membrane over there. And the detour to RDS, which happens in the infant, so sometimes you call it infant RDS or the distress syndrome, the mechanism starts <laughs> always the same with RDS, although the ending is just the same because the RDS is called hyaline membrane disease also. And actually this was seen first and then they found out that it, this happens in adults as well. I mean, this hyaline formation. But the RDS, the cause is what? In newborn, it's always when they are born too early and typically before 32 weeks or we could say before 32 is a limit but let's say we always watch the children till 34th week and every time it seems like there's going to be a preterm birth before 34th week we stop the birth and we're giving a big dose of corticoids to the mother and they will get to the bloodstream of the child and they will boost up type 2 pneumocytes to produce surfactant. So we're trying to save time, stop the birth, give them corticoids, and try to boost up the production of surfactant as possible, because otherwise, if there will be not enough of surfactant, and these children will get born and they will start to they will inhale for the first time unfortunately the lungs will have so hard time to keep be inflated because uh, there will be nothing that reduces the surface tension and that's why they will typically very soon like in the first days uh, start to have the idea so they will get cyanotic they will have dyspnea 
and very likely die, okay? Although over here, this is a very specific cause and that's not enough of surfactant. It leads to a very similar picture as ARDS, okay? So remember, I need surfactant, okay? Yeah, so, so this was small detour, but remember Holland membrane pathologists love to hear that, so remember that. But what is Holland membrane? It's very unspecific, like it's a bulk of m mess, okay? It's nothing special. It's just a pinkish appearance in the microscope. But as I said, it's a chunk of garbage that it's glued together in the alveoli. That's Highland membrane, okay? So suddenly you're having Highland membranes everywhere, like later, but the biggest problem is the edema. And it's the interstitial edema in, in the membrane. And then later, of course, the water will get into the alveoli. So you are like droning. You're droning. Your, your alveoli is full of water, so you can exchange the oxygen. Of, and the Holland membranes then, then form. Okay. But what this leads to later, if you're going to survive now, there's a big question. Because typically, in some cases, and you never know how this is going to end up, I mean, the fibroblasts will come there and basically what happens, you will have a serious restrictive disease later on, okay, as a consequence of ARDS, if you survive. So some people, they survive ARDS and they're fine, but many of them have a fibrotization. And if you imagine, you know, this whole thing is inflamed, so no wonder, and they will have a serious restriction disease okay so the life is getting worse all the way okay so remember hyaline membranes and now we don't know how this is going to end but many of them have a fibrosis of the lung diffuse fibrosis okay anyways how it is with treatment and remember treatment well typically remember ph there is sort of a golden pH where you should really put someone on ventilator and remember some say 7.3 below or 7.35 doesn't matter so every time the pH gets near and near if you hypoventilate to 7.3 so you're having a respiratory acidosis you have to put them on ventilator and basically the sooner the better the sooner the better because what Breathing is very ATP dependent, it's hard. And of course, as any muscle, these breathing muscles and diaphragm, they will get fatigued. And suddenly they can stop breathing and die. So you wanna give them support, you wanna help them. You know, you wanna ease the diaphragm to breathe, okay? So this is one thing, of course, ventilation and oxygen, obviously. But the what's crucial with the ventilator, please remember, and this is crucial for all of you, the alveoli and the membrane, when they're inflamed like this and edematous, it's very fragile. It's very fragile. So the trick over here is to ventilate faster, but with small tidal volume. So how you ventilate them, you ventilate them with a decreased volume. So with a decreased tidal volume, okay? So the breaths are not too deep. This is crucial. And what mode you put on is a PEEP. It's the same like with the surfactant. You don't want the alveoli to get collapsed. So you don't let them to exhale fully, but you keep them in a slight inflation. With this, you keep the alveoli expanded a bit and you prevent their collapse and, and that they will glue together, okay? So, so the trick is ventilate with lower volumes and keep the, this is the positive expiratory end pressure, okay? So that you keep the pressure a bit higher at the end. So they won't exhale fully. And this is a very important outcome. Not only that the alveoli won't collapse, okay? But also the trick is that normally, or you should imagine in ARDS that all alveoli are full of water. So the exchange is really hard oxygen okay like if the capillaries they go like this they have, there's no way how this alveoli could exchange the air but look at that if you keep them a bit inflated 
they're bigger and look at that over here there is some exchange that could go on okay so if you keep the alveoli uh, more like if you keep their volume the diffusion is a bit better and this is the whole trick so you only ventilate them you give them oxygen although of course it helps but the main thing is the ventilation and you pray there is no way how you can treat ARDS except with the ventilation. Okay, that's the main thing. Okay, and one more thing. So you can see the inflation is important, but watch out. On the other hand, this is this is a malpractice in a way. Well, but it happens. I mean, they're trying to save the patient, but the anesthesiologist or the the people at the emergency unit or wherever they should really really watch for barotrauma because there's the opposite thing because if you use too high volumes you can burst the alveoli they will they, they will burst like a balloon so and th this is why you should check the machine all the time and continuously correct the optimal volumes okay yeah so on one hand, you want to keep the alveoli open, but you don't ventilate them with a, such a big volume because the alveoli would burst. And of course, it happens all the time. It's always like, you know, it's, it's a double-edged sword in a way. So many of the lungs of these ventilated patients are bursted up, okay? Some parts, I mean, okay? And one more thing, if you would imagine these situations over here, and what do we have always with ARDS? What's the mechanism? Well, if we would take it in the ventilation perfusion mismatch, and there are many other, here's restriction as well, plus restriction, of course. But over here, what happens? These two, I mean, like these two examples, of course, what does it mean? It means the right to left shunt. So you are shunting everyone who has ARDS, everyone who has pneumonia in general. Remember, there's always a right to left shunt because blood goes through the lungs, but it's not oxygenated. Okay. Yeah. Remember that. So it's one of the main mechanisms in the, let's say, uh, respiratory insufficiency. Okay. Also, of course, you're having a restriction, diffusion problems. Okay. So... So restriction is increased, diffusion is decreased, okay? And the, the ventilation perfusion mismatch, that's the, the magical word. And in this case, it's the, the extreme of the right to left shunt. And still, I mean, this is acute treatment. And for the long-term treatment, you never know. There is no prevention. You don't know which one's going to get where the fibrotization is going to go on. Okay, uh, if they survive, okay, as I said, some of them are functionally okay, like chronically, but some of them, unfortunately, will end with fibrotization. Okay, and chronic, chronic restriction. Okay, yeah. So, I guess that's all for today. Okay, so questions. By the way, with these patients with the fibrotization, sometimes they are trying to give them corticoids as well. To in this case, not to produce surfactant, maybe, but mostly to calm down the calm down the infection or inflammation over there. Inflammation, but it has no like uh, like obvious. Uh, based um, good effect no one knows like like the trials are like we don't know if it helps or not but some 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 doctors give it okay so questions so thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell and as always Check the description below for supplementary questions and other materials.